Oh my God, it's the man. Hi, Rhonda. Hey, Paul. You ready? Yeah. How's this? Much better. Listen, don't get me started. Hi, Carlos. Hey, Jimmy, it's Paul. Hey, Paul. Nice to see you. Man, good to see you. It's been too long. When you play with Panic, mm -hmm. I've seen you go on these five, six, seven, eight, ten minute musical journeys where you'll start a solo and just build it over a very, very long period of time. Mm -hmm. When you play with your solo band, they're more like, there's some of that going on, but it's more like it's part of a tune that you wrote. Uh-huh. Is it the same way? Well, it, sometimes it's, the, it's the, the same kind of approach. The basic idea is to just improvise. And if you know you're, you know how when you're in a, a bigger band and there are more members in the band, it's more like a train, you know, and, it, and it, uh, it, it's, it's not a sports car. You know what I mean? The right. so turns are going to be a little bit slower. Uh, the more people you tend to have in the band than they would be, say, if you were in a five-piece band or a four-piece band where things can turn on a dime. And, it, you know, uh, and musically, in Panic, a lot of times we just play over one chord and that frees up, that frees up the improvisers to be completely and utterly free. You know, uh, if you're just playing over one chord, you know, it's a lot different than if you have a set of changes. And with the other band that you saw, you know, yeah. there's changes involved in most of the That's what I'm flow. talking about. One yeah. more free than the other, and I didn't really understand it. You just explained it. Yeah, and because, the, I mean, you're still improvising, but you're, it's a different set of parameters, you know. Um, but we do both in the other band, you know. Sometimes we'll hit one chord and just go for a long period of time. Like the Miles Davis period where he was doing stuff like, the on the corner record, you know, uh, you know, where you just hit one quarter bitches brew or, you know, any of these kind of experimental things, you know, it can go both ways. It could go the, the heavier the chord changes are, you know, the, the more you have to kind of navigate them when you're soloing over them. I think there's an awful lot of people that look up to you musically uh, mm -hmm. because your band had, the same kind of impact that Mother's Finest did, which it changed the genre of rock a little bit and moved, it moved everything, it shifted it, right? Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for these young musicians that are trying to write and have an impact on the world about what they should do? I know that's a big question, but um, you guys, I remember when, I first, when you guys came, first came on the scene, it shifted my view. It's the same way Man in a Box shifted my view, same way that the first time I heard Santana or Family Stone shifted my view. You guys had, a, you put a shift into the whole thing. How would you advise a young musician who's trying to do that, what, what, how to approach it? I mean, you, I don't, you guys were determined to make an impact. That's clear because the tunes had an impact. You must have felt it in the studio when you did them. Well, you know, the thing about it is you just have to tell the truth as you see it. That, you know, everything that happens is a phenomenon of its time. Everything happens because everything else is happening. Like the Beatles happened because, because of everything else that was happening. Jimi Hendrix happened because of everything. Right. I mean, everything had to prime, you know, Everything is the function is almost a soundtrack to its time and its moment. I agree with you. And so I, I feel like, um, I mean, there's so many wonderful players now, and and because of, of the success of the previous generations, there are actually many more players and songwriters. There are a lot of clever people that are saying the things that they have to say. Number one, number one thing, you have to tell your story. You have to live your life and you have to tell the story that you have to tell. Whether that story, and you have to tell that story, some people are not political. Other people, that's where their focus is. Whatever your, whatever, wherever your life is, you have to bring that to life. 
It could be spiritual, right? It could be a religious thing. It could be all of those things. But the music has to be about something, even your heart, something that's happening to you. It, the, the songs that really move us, that really have an impact on us, they're not, they're not from nothing. They're, up, they're connected to something. So that's, that's, that's the, the number one thing. What was your first guitar, Paul? My mother used to play folk songs. And she would play them and we'd sing them. She had a nylon string guitar. Hmm. Our house got broken in and it got stolen. Thank you. And she bought a really cheap nylon string guitar and that was my first guitar, that one she quit playing. It was called a high-low. It was as cheap a nylon as you could ever have. I had a little four-string ukulele when I was a really little kid. But my first electric guitar, well, my first real one was a Rickenbacker and, or a Melody Maker. And, you know, one of the reasons I started making guitars around is because I couldn't get good ones. And so the only way I could get in the club was to make one. Hmm. I wasn't allowed in the club. So if you're not allowed in the club and you can't get the gear and you want to be in the in the musician club, I made yeah. some. I didn't have a bass amp. I built them. I used to build folded horn bass cabinets. I was a bass player. You don't know that. Hmm. So I used was to something about you. I liked your voice a lot. I had two <laughs> folded horn cabinets, and they, they, they rocked the house. Wow. Wow. Well, I like that, and I like that answer, and I like the fact, like I said before, that you're a man of action. See, that's really special something bothers you you see there's a problem there's a need you kick down the door and you make it happen when you guys started this band did you anticipate that you were going to make it or was it just a hope and a dream did you you know when you got your first record deal did you come unglued giddy and have parties well how did it go what was the story <laughs> uh we you know we we formed in omaha nebraska and so back then before the internet, before record companies, you couldn't really, well, you, it was hard to get record company attention there, I should say. So we we knew we were gonna have to do some work and, and probably move. We ended up moving to Los Angeles and we always had um, kind of a goal in mind. So we'd be like, the first goal was, okay, we gotta figure out how to get somewhere where we can get some attention and then figure out how we can get a record deal. And then after the record deal, um, we signed with Capricorn. They gave us a two record deal, which was we were super excited about because they guaranteed a second record. But we knew, okay, now we had to work and make a record, which first one's always easiest, right? You have a bunch of songs you've been playing for a while. Then the second one came, we had to write all new songs. And so that was another goal just to keep working. So we never really... Um, it's always been about kind of looking into the future and trying to keep growing and stuff. And so it, you know, we never really felt that we had made it, you know what I mean? And so that's kind of, even like now, you know, you still keep working, thinking, um, being inspired to write your best material. And I think every one of the band still feels that way, but you know, it's just been a 30 years, I guess, of always kind of trying to strive to keep growing and and so we never I, I don't know if we've ever really i mean i guess you feel like you make it when you're able to make ends meet you know and 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 earn a living with the band and stuff but it always been our goal you know to be able to have it be our main job you know what i mean earn a living doing that so it's been more of a band than a business relationship yeah you know it it yes and it it's um with the business side, we try, there's five of us, we try and always be as democratic as we can. You know, we try and make the decisions based on what's best for the band and everything. And we're good friends. You know, we moved, when we moved to Los Angeles, we, five of us in a three bedroom house, we rehearsed in the living room. That's where we recorded our, actually our second record in the living room there. And we kind of worked everything out, living in close quarters, traveling in a van. And we got that kind of worked out early um, where everyone kind of knows how to get along and it's just kind of stayed with us, you know, 30 years. It's hard to believe. Huh? Well, I've been in 30 bands in 30 years. So I'm, <laughs> I have a good experience that, you know, it's been around Robin of very, very good musicians. I enjoy playing music very much, but it's not my, it's a hobby for me. 
and making guitars is a business for me. And I would say that there's a core group of people at PRS that sound very much like your band. We've been together, you know, 15, 20 years, 30 years, and we're still making guitars and it seems to be going all right. You're from Kentucky. Yeah. When you do a Kentucky barbecue order, what do you order? Oh, I get ribs and uh, burgoo and mutton. We have mutton here, which is uh, like lamb, I guess baby lamb. I don't know. I don't know a lot about food, but it's delicious. What's the second one? I heard the ribs. What's the second one? Uh, burgoo. What's burgoo? It's like a barbecue soup or stew. I'm assuming that it's just the leftovers of every bit that they cooked that day. But I like it. I think it might be a regional thing. I know it is a regional thing. It sounds delicious. Pretty good. I'm a fan. So my mother used to serve me Rapid Band Scrapple, which is a Texas Maryland thing. Do you guys have Scrapple in Kentucky? No, no, we don't even have Scrabble. None of us can spell. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> don't do that. People will be hating me in this video. <laughs> The first time I walked on the stage and you had that, those two tops and those two 410 cabinets and that guitar, and it sounded exactly like you needed it to to get that whole ball rolling, I was, oh my God, John, thanks for giving us the nod and the chance to do it, because I never had the chance with him. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, and thank you for helping me um, kind of carry a thing forward without... I just didn't want to be holding a guitar that looked exactly like it. You know, yeah. the one Gary was playing. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I mean, that's been the whole puzzle is how do you pay respect to it without standing too, too squarely inside of the silhouette of the thing. And the really fun part of that for both of us was figuring out, well, what makes that sound? What are the variables that contribute to that sound sounding like that? So and yeah, scale you know, length. You don't know this. I called Jimmy Hearing, and we both went middle pickup. Middle pickup. That's right. In fact, solos on the middle pickup. Him. When I played Wolf, the only pickup that was really working was the middle pickup. And when I say working, I don't mean working for me. I mean like operational. <laughs> so the neck pickup had to shorten it. I think it was only one wire was because you know obviously nobody wants to sort of touch it. And the bridge pickup was, I think, a little kind of what, what, what you call, well, what, what uh, it was a little bright. That'd be you call it ice picky. Ice you call picky. it ice picky. Yeah. And the middle pickup. Now, I'm not a middle guy. My entire life has been about taking out the mids, taking out the mids. Yeah. And you actually turned me on to musical mid-range. Yeah. And I had never experienced, to me, and I think a lot of guitar players, Mid-range is kind of like this scientific kind of spike in a thing that you're supposed to need because I guess it's like helps everything else around it move forward. And you turned me on to the idea of mid-range being a musical thing. And now with Dead & Company, at least, I spend most of my time on the middle pickup. And now I'm, you know, recording guitar on records where I go, give me the middle pickup, right? Because the middle... And, and help me with this on a scientific level, because I'm not an engineer on this level. The middle pickup is like the truest pickup, is it not? I think the bass pickup and, and the treble pickup are the truest pickup, but I'm not a middle pickup guy either. But what I do know is most people think of mid-range as oh, and what right. I with mid-range is ah. Right. So to me, I want ah, not all. Oh. That's a brilliant brilliant observation about mid-range what i want to know is that whole period of time in san francisco must have been a magical musical time in the 60s when your band started to play and you know there's so much history from that whole san francisco music scene and you were right in the middle of the whole thing how do you remember it how do you experience it what can you share with people about how that whole thing was well, for me, it was uh, like a child coming to Disneyland for the first time and having a big roll of tickets to ride any, any ride that I wanted to. I have free popcorn, uh, <laughs> strawberry milkshakes, you know, uh, corn dogs. In other words, being in San Francisco at the epicenter of consciousness revolution with the Grateful Dead, Quicksilver, you know, 
all of that, plus Monga Santa Maria and Olotunji and Miles and Ravi Shankar, Jimi Hendrix and Tito Puente, you know, it, it, and B.B. King was, it was a, a, a multi-dimensional gift for me because I got to learn from a, anything that I love, I could learn. That, that's the key thing, just like you, you know, you, your tenacity to follow your clarity, the things that you believe allow for you to be right up there with Gibson and Fender. And sometimes, a lot of, I remember a lot of times your guitars were on more videos than their, their videos in, you know, in the 80s and 80s and 90s, mm. you know. So we both have something in common. We've been blessed to be at a time and a place where we can give birth to our dreams and they and they roll, they they grow and they they expand. You know, uh, we're very blessed, you and I. <laughs> 